I guess we can get started. All right, so today we're going to talk about backprop, and I'm sure for some of you a lot of this is going to look familiar. I'm going to start with some uh, sort of refreshers about sort of basic concepts and, uh, and talk about sort of a more general formulation of, of uh, backprop a little later. And then uh, tomorrow, uh, Alfredo will go through like how you use autograd and things like this in PyTorch. Okay, uh, so basic concepts. Um, we have parameterized models. So parameterized models are nothing more than functions that, depends on, that depend on two parameters, an input and a trainable parameter. And there's no conceptual difference between the parameter and the input. Uh, they're just they're both parameters of the of the deterministic function. The uh, the thing is though the parameter is shared across um, training samples, whereas the samples of course are different for every training sample. So um, uh, in things like in, in most uh, deep learning uh, frameworks, the parameter is actually implicit to the uh, to the parameterized function. When you call the function, you don't actually pass the parameter value. It's sort of stored inside, if you, if, at least in the object-oriented uh, versions of, uh, of models. But uh, just need to remember that you know you have a parameterized model. It's just a parameterized function. It takes an input and it has a parameter vector. It produces an output. Uh, in simple supervised learning, this output goes into a cost function that compares the output of the model with the output you want. Uh, here it's called C. The prediction, uh, the output of the module is called y bar, and the C function compares y and y bar, where y is the output you want, y bar is the output you, the output you get. Um, so I'm giving here two very simple examples of parameterized functions, which I'm sure you're familiar with. The first one is a linear model. So a linear model just computes a weighted sum of the components of its input vector multiplied by weights. Uh, and if you do linear regression uh, with square loss, the, the C function is just the, the, the square distance, Euclidean distance, between the Y vector and the Y bar vector. Uh, y and Y bar can be vectors or scalars um, or tensors or whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, things with numbers in them, basically. Or things that you can compute distances uh, between. That's actually all you need, technically. Uh, but here is a slightly more complicated uh, parameterized function here down, uh, down the bottom, uh, which actually computes nearest neighbor. So here uh, there is uh, the input x, and then w is a matrix. Each row of the matrix is indexed by the index k. And uh, to, to compute the output, we uh, actually um, output the number k, that uh, corresponds to the row of W that is closest to X, okay? So we compute the distance between X and a particular row of W, which is WK, and then we value over all Ks, and we figure out which of those differences is smallest, okay? And we output that K. So argmin, that's what the argmin function does, right? It, it returns the... the, the uh, value of the argument that minimizes the function, right? So it's a function of k, and that returns the k that minimizes that function. The point I'm making with this, uh, which is a complicated way of explaining nearest neighbor, is that uh, the, the type of computation that takes place in your parameterized model could be very complicated. It doesn't have to be just like a neural net, something that you compute with weighted sums and, and, and nonlinearities. It can be something complicated that involves the minimization of something else. It could be the minimum of some function, okay? And we'll come back to this in a few weeks. Professor? Yes. Uh, what that must be WK times something. Uh, like, why are we going to make the difference between X and the weight matrix? You can denote it in a different way. Uh, I could have written uh, uh, W, the W matrix, multiplied by, uh, uh, let's say, a, a Z vector. And the z-vector would be constrained to be a, a one-hot, and in which case you would select a column of w, and then you could do a min over this, this z-vector. Okay? Then, I mean, it would be a different notation, but kind of a different effect, uh, a similar effect. But then, you know, I would have to, return, to write another equation, like, you know, z is one-hot, and explain what that means. Um, 
I mean, forget about the notation. You know, just remember the fact that uh, uh, there could be something complicated going on in, in this parameterized function. It's not necessarily just you know a very simple, very simple thing. So what I've done with this diagram here is that um, I've introduced a sort of way of denoting, of sort of writing neural nets and various other models as block diagrams. Uh, and I'm, I'm using uh, three different types of symbols here, or four, really. Uh, the bubbles represent variables. The, the bubbles that are filled up represent variables that are observed. So X is an observed variable. It's the input to your system. So you observe it on the training set and the test set and whatever. Uh, y bar is a computed variable. So it's, it's uh, something that's just at, you know, produced by a deterministic function. You can just compute from the observed variable through a deterministic function. Uh, so Y similarly is an observed variable because on the, or it's observed on the training set. It's not observed on the test set, but during training it's observed. Um, and then you have two types of functional modules. One type is those kind of blue round shape modules, which represent deterministic functions. And the, the, the round uh, uh, side indicates in which direction it's easy to compute. Okay? So here you can compute Y bar from X. Uh, it's considerably more complicated to compute x from y bar. If I give you a y bar, you will have a hard time giving me an x that corresponds to it. Okay. Um, and then you have another type of module, which are usually uh, used to represent cost functions, uh, represented by squares, red squares, to make them more visible in this case. And they have an implicit output, uh, which is a scalar output, a single number. And they can take multiple inputs and basically compute a single number, uh, usually a distance between the inputs or something similar to that. So with those sort of basic uh, symbols, you can, you, know, you can represent sort of standard supervised learning systems. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, graphical models, this, uh, this is a similar notation that is used in uh, what's called factor graphs, where the squares are factors. Factor graphs don't have those deterministic functions because they don't care about in which, you know, which way uh, dependencies can be computed, but in our case, it's really important. Okay, uh, so loss functions. Uh, so loss functions are things that we minimize during training. And there's two types of loss. There's the per sample loss. So uh, in this case, uh, L of X, Y, W. So you give it a sample, a pair X and Y, and a value of the parameter, and it computes just the scalar value, okay? In our case here, we use a very simple loss, which is just equal to the cost module, the output of the cost module that we put on top of our system. This is kind of the standard sort of supervised running uh, paradigm here, uh, where the loss is simply the average, uh, uh, I mean, the per sample loss is just the output of the cost function that we, we put in. It's not always the case. And then the loss that we actually minimize during training is the average loss over a training set. So a training set S is a set of pairs, X of P, Y of P, for P equals zero to P minus one. And the overall loss, uh, which depends of course on the training set and the parameter values, uh, is the average of the per sample loss over all the samples. And uh, I forgot to say, in the first sum here, it's x, y belongs to s. <laughs> so uh, machine learning is all about uh, optimizing functions, most of the time minimizing functions, sometimes maximizing functions, occasionally uh, finding Nash equilibria between two functions, as in the case of GANs, but most of the time we minimize functions. Uh, and we do this with gradient-based methods. Not necessarily gradient descent, but gradient-based methods. What is a gradient-based method? A gradient-based method is uh, a method that um, finds the minimum of a function assuming that you can easily compute the gradient of that function. So that assumes the function is more or less differentiable. It doesn't actually have to be everywhere differentiable, technically. Um, it needs to be continuous, and it needs to be almost everywhere differentiable, otherwise you run into trouble. But it can have kinks in it, as long as they're not too nasty. Um, and gradient descent, of course, as you probably know, consists in 
computing the, the gradient. So you see a function here at the top. Um, it's got a minimum uh, at the top right. Uh, I, I've drawn the lines of equal cost of that function. And the arrows that you see are the gradient vectors. The gradient is pointing up okay, at every, uh, every location. And the gradient is always orthogonal to the lines of uh, equal cost, okay, equal altitude, if you want. Okay, so gradient descent is like, um, you know, being in the mountain in the fog and it's night and you can't see anything, but you want to go down to the village and so you look around you and you look for the direction of steepest descent and you take a step. Okay, so the little algorithm here at the top, the W vector, which is your position, is replaced by the w, your current W vector minus some constant times the gradient vector, and the gradient vector points up, so when you do minus, uh, you're kind of walking downhill in the direction of steepest descent. Now, this is if eta is a scalar constant, but in sophisticated algorithms, eta can actually be a matrix. So if it's a matrix, if, it, if it's a positive semi-definite matrix, it, you will still go down, Get, go downhill, uh, except that not necessarily in the direction of steepest descent. In fact, the direction of steepest descent is not necessarily the one you want to go to. Um, if you have a situation like the one at the top, where the, the value is a little elongated, the gradient actually does not point towards the minimum. It points to, you know, off, off center. And so if you want to go directly to the minimum, you don't want to follow the gradient. You want to be a little smarter than this. And by using... Uh, uh, sort of eta that are mat matrices, you can actually, you could in principle do this uh, with so-called second-order methods, uh, which are still gradient-based methods. Um, but they're kind of impractical in most cases. Uh, we'll talk about some issues with this uh, in a few weeks. Now, um, there are algorithms that are not gradient-based. Um, optimization algorithms that are not gradient based. So when your function is not differentiable, when it's like a golf course, you know, it's flat and it's got a hole in it, or when it's kind of staircase-like, where the gradient doesn't give you any information, useful information, or when it may be differentiable, but you don't know the function, you don't, you don't wrote the, you don't write, you didn't write the program that actually compu computes it, because that function might, might be the entire environment around you, uh, then you cannot compute the gradient efficiently, okay? So then you have to resort to other methods. Methods are called uh, zeroth order methods or gradient-free methods. And there's a whole bunch, a whole family of those functions, uh, of those uh, methods, which I'm not going to talk about, okay, at all. Uh, deep learning is all about gradient-based methods. Uh, that said, if you're interested in reinforcement learning, most of reinforcement learning actually uses uh, gradient estimation without the gradient. What you want is, uh, I don't know, you want to get a robot to learn to uh, ride a bike. And once in a while, the robot falls. And you don't have a gradient for the objective function that says don't fall. Or the objective function that measures how long you, the bike stays up without falling. Nobody tells you what to do to minimize that cost function, right? So you have to try things. You can't compute a gradient of that function. Okay, so in RL, your cost function is not differentiable most of the time. But the network that computes the output that goes into the uh, environment is differentiable, okay? So from that point on, that's, uh, that's gradient-based. Only the cost is not differentiable. Okay, so there'll be a situation like uh, the diagram I, I showed earlier. Imagine here that G is differentiable. You can compute the gradient of the output of G with respect to the parameters and its input and everything, but C is not differentiable. In fact, it's completely unknown. The only thing you know about C is that if you give it a Y bar and a Y, it tells you the value, but it doesn't give you the gradient. Okay, that's kind of what RL is. There are other things about RL, okay, but that's the basic difference between reinforcement learning and uh, supervised learning. Yeah. Well, the reward is just the output of C, that's all, okay? So C is a black box, and what you get is the output of C. You don't, you don't get a Y either, right? So you're not being told what the correct answer is. Uh, 
Uh, you just have a black box, you give it a white bar, and it gives you C. That's it. You can't compute the gradient of C with respect to y bar. That's right. So what you do is you change y bar a little bit and you see does C go up or down? If it goes down, you kind of reinforce that. If it goes up, you do something else. Okay? So basically you're telling the system how good it's doing without telling it the correct answer and it doesn't have access to a gradient. Okay? So what that tells you is that RL is horribly inefficient. Right? Because you don't have a gradient. So you have to try, you know, if the, if the output uh, y bar is low dimensional, then, you know, it's okay, right? Uh, you, can, you can try to make it larger, smaller, things like that, but it's not too bad. If y bar is a high dimensional vector, um, there's like such a huge space to search, there's probably no way you're going to find an optimal uh, value for it unless you try lots and lots of different times, right? Um, so that's a huge problem with RL. A lot of techniques in RL actually, I'm not going to talk about RL in this course actually, except today maybe. Uh, but a very popular technique in RL uh, is so-called uh, actor-critic methods. And a critic method basically consists in having a second C module, which you know, which is a trainable module, and you train your, C, your own C module, which is differentiable, to approximate the one, to approximate the, the cost function, the value function that you get, the rewards, the reward function you get. So the reward is the inverse of a cost, okay? So, I mean, this is the negative of a cost. <clears throat> it would be more like a punishment, actually. But, um, so then that's, that's a way of uh, making the cost function differentiable, or at least approximating it by a differentiable function, and then you can just use backprop. So the, you know, uh, AC, AAC, and AAAC are versions of this. Actor critic, advantage actor critic, etc. Okay. Um, right, so you, what you have to know how to do is compute the gradient of your per sample uh, your, of your objective function with respect to the parameters. In practice, uh, we all use stochastic gradient, as you um, are probably aware. So instead of uh, computing the gradient of the entire objective function, which is the average of all samples, we just take one sample, compute the loss, L, big L, compute the gradient of this loss with respect to the parameters, and then take one step in a negative gradient direction. Okay, so that's the, 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 the second formula here. Uh, w is replaced by W minus some step size times the gradient of the per sample loss function uh, with respect to the parameter for a given sample, XP, YP. Yep. Yep. Okay, so uh, in practice, people use batches. So instead of uh, doing this on a single sample, so first of all, if you do this on a single sample, you're going to get a very noisy trajectory. You're going to get a trajectory like the one you see here at the bottom, where instead of the parameter vector directly kind of going downhill, it's going to oscillate. So some people say it should not be called SGD, which means stochastic gradient descent, because it's not actually a descent algorithm. Should be called stochastic gradient optimization, but it's, it's stochastic, so it's very noisy. Every sample you get is going to pull in a different direction, and it's just the average that pulls you towards the minimum of the average. Um, so it looks inefficient, but in fact, it's actually fast. It's much faster than batch gradient, at least in the context of machine learning, when uh, the samples have some redundancy between them, and uh, it, it goes faster to do stochastic gradient. So uh, to the, the question of batching. So what people do most of the time is that they compute the average of the gradient over a batch of samples, not a single sample, and then do one step. And the only reason for doing this, this has nothing to do with uh, you know, algorithmic um, uh, convergence uh, efficacy or anything. The only reason for doing this is because the kind of hardware we, uh, that is given to us that are, is at our disposal, GPUs and multi-core CPUs, uh, 
is more efficient if you, if you have batches. It's easier to parallelize, so you get more efficient computation use of your hardware if you use batches. It's a bad reason for batching, but we have no choice until you know, someone builds a piece of hardware that actually is properly designed. The reason we have to do this, uh, again, is, for, is because the, the chips that we have, you know, NVIDIA GPUs, um, are sort of you know, heavily parallelized, but they, they, they're parallelized in a simple way, and um, the, the simplest way to parallelize is to batch. Yes? Uh, if there was no redundancy in the data set, would it be better to use full batch redundancy? Yeah, but, uh, okay, so, so here is why stochastic gradient is, is, is better, right? If I give you a million samples, but in this million samples, I actually I only have actually 10,000 different samples, and I repeat those 10,000 samples 100 times, and I shuffle them, and I give you this uh, training sample, and I give you it's a million samples. You don't know it's actually only 10,000 samples repeated 100 times. If you use batch gradient, you're going to compute 100 times the same quantities and average them. So you're going to spend 100 times more computation than necessary. Whereas if you use stochastic gradient, by the time you've seen 20,000 samples, you've already done two iterations, you know, two passes through your entire training set. Okay, so it'll be at least 100 times more efficient. So the question is, you know, what's, uh, you know, how, how much can you uh, average in a batch without losing, uh, you know, efficiency in the redundancy. And some people have done experiments with this. There's some empirical evidence that the number of samples that you can put in a batch is roughly uh, equal to the number of categories you have if you do classification between one and two times the number of categories you have. So if you train on ImageNet, you have 1,000 categories. Uh, you, can, you can have batches up to about 2,000. And be, beyond this, you start losing uh, conversion speed. Just a follow-up question. What if all the million images were uh, independent? Like there was no redundancy? Uh, that means they're completely random, basically. I mean, that never occurs, right? Because think about, okay, think about the following scenario that uh, you give me that training set, and what I do is that I split it in half, and I use the first as a training set, and the second, one, the second half as a validation set. If there is zero redundancy in your in your um, in your set, that means my machine is not going to work at all, right? It's not going to be able to generalize on the second half, right? So if there is any possibility of generalization, there has to be some redundancy. Okay. So let's start simple and talk about traditional neural nets, okay? Traditional neural nets... Uh, are basically interspersed layers of linear operations and pointwise nonlinear operations. So the linear operation, you have uh, an input vector, you compute a weighted sum of that vector uh, with a bunch of weights, and in this case here we have six inputs with th three hidden units in the first layer, so there's three different sets of weights with which we compute weighted sums of the six inputs. The, uh, conceptually, the operation to go from the input, the six-dimensional input vector to the three-dimensional uh, weighted sum is just a matrix vector multiplication, right? Take the input vector, multiply it by a matrix formed by the weights. Uh, it's going to be a three-by-six matrix, right? And so you multiply this by a six-dimensional vector, you get a three-dimensional vector. Okay, so that's the first type of operation in a classical neural net. And the second type of operation is that you take all the components of the, the vector, the weighted sums, and you pass them through simple nonlinearities. In this case, this is called a ReLU. It's called a half-wave rectification in uh, engineering. Um, you know, there's different names for it, but basically it's the positive part, mathematically. Uh, so it's equal to identity when, X, when the argument is positive and it's equal to, to uh, zero when the argument is negative. And then you repeat the process. So the third stage is again a linear stage. Multiply that three-dimensional vector by a matrix. In this case, a two-by-three matrix. You get a two-dimensional vector, pass the components to nonlinearities. Okay? Um, I call this a two-layer network because I think what matters are the pairs linear and nonlinear. Okay, so most people will call this a two-layer network. Some people will call this a three-layer network because they count the variables, but I don't think that's fair. 
you do this, but you don't want to, you don't want to do this. Um, if there is no nonlinearities in the, in the middle, as I said last week, uh, you might as well have a single layer because the product of two linear functions is a linear function, and so you can collapse them into a single one. Basically, a single matrix that is the product of the two matrices. Okay, so here, is, here it is in a little more detail. Uh, the sum of unit i is, so si, which is the weighted sum for unit i, is, uh, is the sum over all the predecessors of i, uh, which is denoted up of i, okay? Uh, so the j index goes over all the predecessors of i of wij times zj, where zj is the output, the j's output from the previous layer. This is a sort of stack, you know, kind of regular layered neural net. And then you take uh, a particular SI and you pass it through one of those nonlinear functions F uh, and you get ZI. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, how we compute gradients and things like this. And there's two forms of it, okay? There is an intuitive form that I'm going to explain right now, uh, which does not even require you to know what a derivative is, funnily enough. Um, and then there is a slightly more general form, and there's an even more general form that maybe I'll talk about next week. Okay, so let's say we have a big network, we have a cost function, um, and so our thing has an X and a Y, and it's got a cost coming out, but in fact, you don't need to make this assumption. The only assumption you need to make is that you have some parameterized function that produces a scalar on the output. That's it. Okay? Um, and somewhere in that net network, you have a nonlinear function H. Um, I called it F in the previous slide, but I called it H here. So it takes a, one of those weighted sum S, you pass it through this H function, and then it produces one of those Z, Z variables. Okay? I'm not putting an index here because, you know, it's just I'm taking one particular... Uh, uh, you know, one of those functions outside of the network, and I, I view the, the rest of the network as kind of a black box. So let's assume that, okay, so we're going to use chain rule. Chain rule, if you remember, from kindergarten. Um, <laughs> okay, high school. Okay, college. Um, if you have two functions that follow each other, you know, g of h of s, and you want to differentiate it, uh, so g of h of s prime is equal to the derivative of g at point h of s multiplied by the derivative of h at point s. All right? This is going back. All right. Clear. Okay. Um, but if you've gone through, uh, you know, a couple of years of college, uh, you can write this uh, the way Newton wrote it or earlier or whatever uh, with the infinitesimal quantities, so you can write dc over ds, which means the derivative of c with respect to s, is equal to dc over dz times dz over ds, okay? So it's the derivative of c with respect to z, z multiplied by the derivative of z with respect to s. And the nice, the nice reason for writing it like this is that it's obvious, you can simplify it by dz, right? You have dz at the bottom and at the top. And so by simplifying by dz, this is the second line, you get dc over ds. Okay, so you kind of split the, the derivative by having sort of an intermediate variable that you put at the bottom and at the top, right? It's very simple manipulation, symbolic manipulation. Now, dz over ds is just the derivative of z with respect to s, but z is equal to h of s, so that's just h prime of s. Okay, so dc over ds is equal to dc over dz times h prime of s. So if, if someone gives you the derivative of the cost function with respect to z, you multiply it by the derivative of your nonlinear function, and you get the derivative of the cost function with respect to s. Okay? So imagine you have a chain of those functions in your network. You can back propagate by multiplying by the derivatives of all those h functions, h functions one after the other, all the way back to the, to the bottom. <laughs> 
Okay? So basically, if you want to compute a gradient, you basically have to use a network that looks very much like this one, except you have signals that go backwards. And wherever you had an H function, what you have now is a derivative coming from the top. Okay, so scalar, just the same as Z. You multiply it by the derivative of the H function, and then you get the derivative of the cost function with respect to the input variable to H, which is S. So basically what you, what you have now is a, basically a transform network that computes your gradient. Okay? Now, you can convince yourself of this because uh, if you don't really sort of completely grok chain rule, uh, which I hope you do, but um, imagine that you are, you know, twiddling S by little, okay? We're going we're gonna to perturb S by DS. So as we go through H, H has a slope, which is S prime of S. So Z is going to be perturbed by ds times that derivative, right? ds times h prime of s, okay? And this is what is being written here. Uh, perturbing s by ds will perturb z by dz equal ds times h prime of s. This will perturb c by this whole perturbation dz times the gradient of, I mean, the derivative of c with respect to, to z, right? Which is dc over dz. So basically, we get that dc equals dz, the perturbation of z. So the perturbation of c is equal to the perturbation of z, dz, times the gradient of, or the derivative of c with respect to z. Okay, but we've computed this uh, uh, dz before. We know it's ds times h prime of s. So we just substitute in, and then we pass ds on the other side, and we get simply that uh, dc over ds equals dc over dz times h prime of s. Okay, we just rederive chain rule. Okay, I've done nothing more than rederiving chain rule. But it's a little more intuitive if you think of it in terms of, you know, twiddling things around. And sometimes it's useful when you're writing the backprop function for a module to think in those terms. Okay, because sometimes it's easier to think about it in those terms than to actually write down the equations. Um, all right. Now we had two types of modules in our in our Neural net, the other one is a linear module, okay? And for this one, I'm gonna, again, view the entire network as a black box, except for just three connections going from a Z variable to a bunch of S variables. Okay, so an S variable is a weighted sum. Uh, so S0, for example, is gonna take Z, the Z at the bottom here, by multiplying it by its own w, which I call w0, okay? I drop all indices that are annoying. And so then I gotta ask again the question, if I, if I twiddle z, by how much will c be twiddled, okay? So if I twiddle z, s0 is gonna be twiddled by z times w0, right? Because z is multiplied by w0. So if, I, so if w0 is, is two, and I twiddle z by, by dz, the output uh, after the weight is gonna be twice, okay? It's gonna be twiddled by twice the value. But now z actually influences several variables, in this case three, so it's also going to uh, cause a perturbation for S of 1 and S of 2. The perturbation for S of 1 is going to be uh, uh, dz w1, and for S of 2 is going to be dz w2. Okay, so the uh, overall uh, perturbation, uh, now, okay, so, so we get uh, dz times w0, that is the perturbation for S0, dz times w1 for s1, dz times w2 for s2, but now s0, s1, and s2 are going to influence c, and the question is by how much? So uh, c is going to vary by whatever s0 was varying times the derivative of c with respect to s0, right? But also, c is also going to vary because s1 is varying and also because s2 is varying, if the variations are small enough, then the overall variation is, variation is just the sum of the three variations. Okay? And so what you have here at the bottom is that the uh, entire variation of the cost is going to be equal to the variation of z multiplied by w0 
multiply, which uh, is the variation of S0, and then you're going to have to multiply that by the derivative of C with respect to S0, which is dC over dS0. Okay, so what you see here at the last, the last equation is exactly that. Um, and, uh, and you have to sum the contributions from the, the three components. Okay? So dC over dZ in the end is dC over dS of 0 times W0 plus dC over dS1 times W1 plus dC over dS2 times W2. Okay? When you have a branch like this, you perturb the input variable, all branches are perturbed, and you have to sum up the result on the cost function. Okay? Which you assume you know, those are the dc over d whatever variables. Any question? Is that clear? Incomprehensible? Okay, what does that mean? Like, look at this uh, formula here. It says, if I have the gradient of, or if I have the derivative of C, the derivative, derivatives of C with respect to S0, S1, and S2, okay, all three of them, then I compute the weighted sum of those derivatives with the weights going up, but I'm using them going down, and that gives me the derivative of the cost function with respect to Z, which feeds those three weights. So basically, when you backpropagate through a neural net, you compute weighted sum of gradients using the weights backwards. Okay? All right, so this is to give a little bit of intuition, but there is a much more general, general formulation for this. Um, before we do this, uh, let's, let's write it this way, okay? Let's do it one step at a time. So conceptually, a neural net, the way you want to see it is, is more something like this, where you have uh, at least a, a traditional neural net, where you have an input variable, you multiply that input variable by the first matrix W0, that gives you S1, and then pass that through a nonlinearity that gives you Z1, then multiply that by a weight matrix W1 that gives you S2, pass that through a nonlinearity that gives you Z2, linear again, blah, blah, blah. How many, how many, uh, how many layer neural net is this? Three, yes. A layer is kind of a pair, linear, nonlinear, right? Most modern neural nets don't actually have clear linear, nonlinear separations. They're like more complex things. Okay, so, uh, so SK plus one basically equals WK times ZK, where WK is a matrix, ZK is a vector, SK plus one uh, is a vector. And then zk equals h sk, where h is kind of uh, application of a scalar h function to every component. So if you want to write this in PyTorch, you write something like this. Uh, there's many ways to write it in PyTorch. You can, you can write it from scratch, you can write it in a functional way, or you can write it this way, which is more like object-oriented, and it kind of hides a, a bit of complexity for you. Um, so you import Torch. Um, you import, import an N from Torch. You make a sort of an input, which is some three order three tensor. Uh, you count how many elements it has, and that's going to be the size of your input layer. We're going to turn it into a vector, okay? But not yet. And then you de define a class for your neural net. Uh, so the the constructor is going to just initialize three linear layers. So linear layers need to, in this case be separate objects because they contain a vector for the parameter. The values don't need to be separate objects because they don't actually have parameters. Okay? Um, so that's the complexity that's hidden in, in those NN linear. So NN linear actually does a little bit more than just multiplying by a matrix. It also adds a bias vector. Uh, but that's okay. So you initialize those layers with the right sizes that you pass as argument to the constructor. Uh, and then you define a forward function, which is, you know, how you can uh, compute the output uh, as a function of the input. And so the, the first line here, uh, x dot view minus 1, just flattens the input tensor into a, into a vector. And then you apply the n0 module to x, you get s1. Then uh, apply the ReLU, the nonlinearity to s1, you get z1, et cetera, et cetera. And then you return s3. Uh, 
Okay, and the beauty of uh, PyTorch, which uh, um, Alfredo will explain to you perhaps tomorrow, is that you don't need to worry about computing the gradient because as you, you've, you've written the forward function and PyTorch knows what this looks like and it knows how to backpropagate gradient to it. It knows how to transform the graph that corresponds to your forward function into a graph that corresponds to the backprop function, so you don't have to worry about it. But you still need to know how to compute gradients because sometimes you have to write your own module. You invent this new type of neural net and it's got this new, you know, like, you know, multi-head, multi-tail, you know, memory, attention, ASTM, whatever. Um, you know, you have to write your own thing and you basically, you might have to write your own CUDA kernel or whatever, right? But it's pretty simple. Yes? Uh-huh. So as I said, if you don't have a nonlinearity, right. the whole thing is linear, so it doesn't, there's no point having layers, right. okay? Now you have to think, you know, what is the simplest nonlinearity you can think of? It's gonna be a point-wise, you know, component-wise nonlinearity. What's, what's the simplest component-wise nonlinearity you can think of? Something that has a single kink. Now the funny thing is, we're talking about gradient-based learning, and this is not even differentiable, right? Because it's got a kink. Um, but, if you're a mathematician and you're obsessively compulsive about it, you would call this not gradient, but a subgradient. Um, but you know, how many mathematicians are there here? Um, there are arguments on PyTorch forums like which subgradient should we use? Yes. In this part of the function. There's several subgradients. So if you have a function that has a kink in it, at this point, uh, any slope that is between this one and that one. Is, is, is correct, it's fine, okay? All of those are, are good subgradients. And so the question is, you know, should you use something in kind of somewhere in the middle or just zero? It doesn't matter because it's just one point. So it has no impact, no practical impact. Okay, so here's the slightly more general form. We're going from the kind of specific to the slightly more general. Uh, so here's um, a form of chain rule for modules that may have multiple outputs and multiple inputs, or may have inputs that are vectors and outputs that are vectors. Okay, I don't, I don't give them different symbols here. The, the basic formula, dc over dzf in this case, equal dc over dzg times dzg over dzf holds, right? This is the same chain rule formula that we wrote previously for scalar functions. It also applies to vector functions. Okay, but there's one thing that we need to remember. Um, the gradient of the scalar function with respect to a vector is a vector of the same size as the vector with respect to which you uh, differentiate. But if you, if you write it this way and you want the notations to be consistent, it's a row vector. It's not a column vector anymore. Okay? So we take a scalar function, which depends on a vector, therefore a column vector. Differentiate this scalar function with respect to, the, to this uh, column vector, and what you get is a row vector. That's the gradient. It's not the gradient technically. The gradient is once you transpose it, but... It's DC over DZF. That's the that's the notation, and you can see that it kind of checks out. So let's imagine that uh, ZG is a vector, a ve you know, a, a column vector, so of size DG by one, and ZF is a column vector of size DF by one. Uh, then this uh, little uh, chain rule uh, equation here gives you a row vector of size df is equal to a row vector of size dg multiplied by a matrix whose number of uh, rows is dg and number of columns is df. Okay? And of course, the size, the last size of 
the vector and the first size of the matrix have to match if you want this product to work out. So a more convenient form for this would be to kind of transpose everything, to say dc over dzf transpose, which is now a column vector, is equal to the transpose of the product here, and that would be the transpose of dz over dzf times the transpose of dc over dzg. And that would be kind of a more convenient form of writing it, but it's kind of simpler this way, more consistent. OK, so what's this uh, funny animal here, dzg over dzf? So we have uh, a little neural net here that has two modules in it, uh, f and g. The output of, f, the, of the f module is zf, and the output of the g module is zg. OK? And basically, we want the gradient of the cost function with respect to zf. We assume we know the gradient of this cost function with respect to zg. We know how to backpropagate through c. And to compute the gradient with respect to zf, if we know the gradient with respect to zg, we need to multiply by this matrix dzg over dzf, which is called the Jacobian matrix of g with respect to uh, its input. OK, g has two arguments, so we can differentiate it with respect to z or with respect to w. We're just going to differentiate it with respect to z. Okay, what is this matrix? So the uh, uh, entry ij of that matrix, the Jacobian matrix, is equal to the partial derivative of the ith output, okay, the ith component of the output vector of the G module with respect to the jth component of the input vector. So if I twiddle the jth input, it's going to make all the output tw uh, twiddle. And that basically is an entire column of the Jacobian matrix. OK, that's backprop, right? So if you have um, a network composed of a cascade of modules, you just keep multiplying by the Jacobian matrix of all the modules going down, and you get all the gradients with respect to all the internal uh, variables. Now, you actually need two sets of, of gradients. You need the gradients with respect to the states, but also the gradients with respect to the weights. And as I, as I said, a module that has parameters has two uh, Jacobian matrices. It has one with respect to its input state and another one with respect to its parameters. OK, so you have the two equations here. So let's say now you have kind of a slightly more general neural net, which is a stack of uh, you know, many modules. Uh, each module is called fk. So k is kind of a, an index for that module. And its input is zk, and its parameter is wk. Uh, and it, the output is you know, zk plus 1. So zk plus 1 equals fk of zk wk. Very simple. So how do I compute dc over dzk, which is the gradient of the cost function or whatever function you want to minimize, with respect to the input of module zk, assuming I know dc over dzk plus 1 already, you just multiply by the Jacobian matrix of the module k, which is dzk plus 1 over dzk, or in other words, dfk of zk wk with respect to zk. OK, so it's just chain rule again. dz over dzk equals dc over dzk equals dc over dzk plus 1, which I assume I know, times the Jacobian matrix of fk with respect to zk. Second line is same thing with respect to w. dc over dwk is equal to dc over dzk plus 1, which I already had at the, t at the top, and then dzk plus 1 over dwk, which is the Jacobian matrix of the f function with respect to its weights, to its parameters, whatever they are. That's all there is to backprop. Are we okay? Any questions? 
is a little concrete example. Well, semi concrete. Um, so let's say we have you know one of those simple functions here, uh, g of x w. We don't know what's inside, but it's okay. And it goes to a cost function. It's a graph. And through this manipulation of you know multiplying by uh, Jacobian matrices, we can transform this graph into the graph that will compute the the gradients going backwards. And so things like PyTorch and TensorFlow do, do this automatically for you. You write a function, it turns it into a graph, and then there is something that turns this graph into the derivative graph, if you want, that backpropagates the gradient. So in this case here, the, the gradient graph looks like the one at the, at the right. Where well, you start with one at the top, and then you compute the Jacobian of uh, C with respect to Y bar, you multiply this one number by this Jacobian. Jacobian is actually a, a vector, okay? It's a gradient. It's a row vector. And that's dc over dy bar. Then you multiply that by the Jacobian of uh, g with respect to its weight, and you get the gradient with respect to the weights. That's what you need to train. So that's an example of, you know, Automatic transformation. That's what Autograd does. Now, where it becomes complicated is when the the graph, the architecture of the graph, is not fixed, um, but is data dependent. So let's imagine that depending on the value of x, uh, you have a test in your neural net code that decides that you know if x is a vector that is longer than a certain length, then you do, some, you do one thing, and if it's shorter, you do another thing. Um, you know, then you're going to have kind of a condition and two graphs depending on the input, right? You still need to generate the graph for backpropagation. If you have loops, it becomes complicated. You can still do it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it, it usually doesn't work very well if uh, the number of loops that you have is more than, say, 50. I'm saying 50, it could be 20, right? It depends. Uh, and you probably heard of LSTM, and what's special about LSTM compared to regular recurrent nets is uh, one way of basically making them work for longer than, like, five. <laughs> okay. But they don't work very well past 20 or so. The point is that you can have a variable number of uh, steps. It's, it's specified by program, and it could be variable. It depends on the size of the input. Uh, a lot of the neural nets that people use nowadays have a variable size. Uh, X is, could be a variable size multidimensional array, and that means G has variable size inside, and you can have you know, kind of complicated things going on there. Um, so again, in terms of... Uh, the, the sizes that uh, those things take. Um, so dc over dw is, uh, is a row vector, which is 1 by n, where n is the number of components of w. Uh, dc over dy bar is 1 by m, where m is the dimension of the output. And dy bar over dw is uh, number, of number of rows is the number of outputs of, of g, and the number of columns is the dimension of W, which is N. So it checks out. Um, it's, all, it's all fine. OK. Now, what kind of uh, modules are we using uh, in neural nets? So as I said, uh, the linear and ReLU modules, or nonlinear, pointwise nonlinearity modules, are just two examples of things that we use to build neural nets, but or to build deep learning systems in general. But there's tons of and tons. I mean, if you look at the PyTorch documentation, there is like a huge list of them, of such modules. And the reason why you need a lot, a lot of them, I mean, most of them are kind of can be built out of kind of smaller, uh, like more elementary functions. But the reason why they are pre-built 
uh, is because first they have a name but, and they're debugged, but also because they're optimized. Um, so sometimes you can kind of write, you know, CUDA kernels directly or, you know, they're generated by a compiler or something. So, but here's a bunch of uh, elementary modules. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to use my... Oops. Okay, uh, let's start with a duplicate module. So, what is a duplicate module? It's a uh, it's a module that takes a single takes you know it's, it's basically a a Y connector. Okay, um, you want two people to listen to music on your iPhone, you need one of those Y cables. Um, so. The first output is equal to the input, and the second output is also equal to the input. Okay, y1 equals x, y2 equals x. So you think, you know, you would think that you don't even need a module like this, but you actually do. Um, sometimes, in fact, in PyTorch, it's kind of implicit, but um, but you need to make it explicit sometimes. So whenever you have a wire that splits into two or n, on the way back, the gradients get summed. Okay, and it's exactly the same situation that I explained earlier. In fact, you can decompose this little module that I explained here. You can think of this uh, Z variable splitting into three wires as, a, as one of those branch modules. And as those three wires converge, you have to sum the gradients, okay? Which we figured out, but you can you can sort of build this into this uh, split module, this duplicate module, or triplicate, or n-ticket, whatever it is. Okay, so whatever you copy a variable, whatever you use a variable in multiple places, you need to sum the gradients. Again, the auto grading in PyTorch does this for you, but remember this. Uh, so add, so if you have two variables and you sum them up, when you twiddle this guy, the output will twiddle by the same quantity. When you twiddle this guy, the output will twiddle by the same quantity. What that means is that the gradient of whatever function you want to minimize with respect to the output of a sum is equal to the... is equal... When you have the gradient of the cost function with respect to the sum, what is the gradient with respect to each of the two branches that you added up? Uh, the first branch with respect to the first output and for the second branch with respect to the second output. Uh, it's actually equal for both branches. Okay? So if you have a connection going this way and you get a gradient from the top, you just copy the gradient. Okay? It's because you get the same influence from both sides. But that depends on uh, how the, uh, that both inputs should be same. No. It's independent of the value of the inputs. <laughs> you have to think about it, but it's pretty obvious. <coughs> Actually, let me try this. Are going to be able to do this? Okay. <coughs> this work? Ha. Huh. Only works if I mirror my screen. Because I can't write on a screen that doesn't exist. Okay, hang on with me for just a minute here. No, that's not what I wanted. <coughs> 
Okay. Oops. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Here we go. Sorry about that. That's control plus that actually works. Okay, let's see if this works. So, um, so if y equals x1 plus x2, dc over dx1, let's say, is equal to dc over dy, dy over dx1. Okay, this we assume we know. How much is this? One. And of course, dy of the x2 is also one. Okay, so there you have it. dc over dx1 equals dc over dy. dc over dx2 equal dc over dy. Just take dc over dy, copy it, and you're done. Uh, max, that's an interesting one. So, y equals max of x1, x2. dc over dx1 equal dc over dy, dy over dx1, right? That's just chain rule. What is dy over dx1? Yep. And otherwise? It's one. Yes, correct. So in fact, you can completely understand this graphically. Basically, you have x1. Uh, say again? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Right, so the answer was dy of dx1 is 0 if x2 is larger than x1, and is 1 if x1 is larger than x2. Uh, but intuitively, it's very simple. If you have variable x1 and variable x2, basically, the output, this max module is basically just a switch. Okay? Um, I'm putting an arrow here, but it's not an arrow. It's a switch. Okay, I can move this switch from left to right. Okay, I can choose to connect x1 to y or to connect x2 to y. Now, once I've decided on which side I connect, it's just a wire, right? Regardless on how high I chose to put this switch in one position or the other, in this case I use max, okay? But it's just a switch that I decide to put on one side or the other. When I decide to put it on one side, then I've just connected x1 to y, and it's just a wire. So x2, if I twiddle it, has no influence on the output. Therefore, the gradient of the cost function with respect to x2 is 0. OK? And the gradient of the cost function with respect to uh, x1 is, of course, equal to the gradient of the cost function with respect to y, because it's just a wire. It's the same variable, really. OK? So that generalizes. to a switch, a switch of multiple variables. So however many variables I have, if the output is determined by 
you know, a, a switch that I can move to one of the input variables. Then when I back propagate, I just propagate through the variable that was connected and the other ones just get zero. Okay? It's easier to kind of draw this way than to actually write the math. You have to use delta functions and stuff. It's okay, log softmax, that's a fun one. Oh, I have to use a new page. But next page actually doesn't go to the next page. Okay. So softmax is a module where the output yi is equal to e to the xi. So it's a module with um, which I should not draw this way, which I should draw this way, and it has as many outputs as it has inputs. I'm calling these the yi, and these the xj, let's say, okay, or x whatever. Um, so softmax is this. Okay, it's a very convenient way of transforming a bunch of numbers into a bunch of positive numbers between 0 and 1 that sum to 1. Okay, when I take the exponential, so x, the xj's can be any number. When I take the exponential of those numbers, I get positive numbers. And I normalize by their sum, so what I get is a bunch of numbers that are between 0 and 1 and sum to 1, which some people call a probability distribution. Okay, so you can interpret yi as a vector of probabilities over a discrete set of outcomes. What is log softmax? Um, so log softmax is, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. It's the log of that. So you get the log of the stuff at the top minus the log of the stuff at the bottom, right? So you get the log of exponential xi, and that's going to be xi, unless I'm mistaken. And then you get the log of the sum of, you get minus the log of the sum of the exponentials of xj's, right? So that will give us xi minus log of sum over j, of e to the xj. That's called log softmax. Now, uh, the guy who invented softmax in 1989 or so, or maybe 88, I don't remember, is a gentleman by the name of John Bridle, a, uh, from Britain, and he regretted calling it uh, softmax. He said it should have been called soft augmax. Uh, but it's too late. People call it softmax. So um, here's an interesting exercise for you. I'm not going to tell you how you backpropagate through this, OK? But I want you to do the calculation. That's a very good exercise. So log softmax is actually a module in Python. but uh, do it on your own. It's a perfect exercise. So basically, compute dc over dx k, assuming that you know all the dc over dy i's, okay? So you're going to have a bunch of dc over dy i's. Uh, so here you only have one output, actually, but that's okay. So let's say there is only one yi, and you know the gradient of the loss with respect to this yi, 
what is the gradient of the loss with respect to all of the xk's? That's good exercise. Is it an official homework? So tonight. It's an official homework tonight. Okay. <laughs> it's more than just an exercise. You can find the answer, but it's more fun to kind of, you know, I mean, you're not, you don't, you don't run as much if you don't kind of try by yourself, if you just look at the answer. What's the difference between softmax and log softmax? Okay, so uh, the uh, softmax and log is a combination of, of modules that is very commonly used in, in uh, multi-class classification, right? So you would take a neural net, the last module would be a softmax, so it would normalize all the outputs, make them positive, make them look like probabilities. And what you want is you want to uh, maximize the probability that the model gives to the correct answer. Okay? So you know the correct answer is bird. Bird is number four in your categories. You want the fourth output of your softmax to be as high as possible. Okay? Um, so that's the, that would be log softmax. Um, now, if you separate this in two things, so if you have softmax and then you take the log of the output as your cost function, the log of the correct output as your cost function, uh, you, get a, you get numerical issues because you don't get log of zero, okay? So as the score gets very, very small, the log kind of diverges and you get sort of numerical problems. So you're better off writing log softmax directly as a single module uh, because then the, that numerical issue disappears. What is the log view that you don't get from only using the software? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, in fact, it's a very good question for the next 20 minutes. Um, not just the next 20 minutes, actually. And I stupidly put my pen back. Did I? What did I do with my pen? I have no idea what I did with the pen. It's here. Okay. Um, okay, so let's say we're going to have a neural net, and it's going to take a, an x variable, and then it's going to have a w0, and then a ReLU, and then W1. Okay, and now we get uh, a bunch of scores, and we want to turn this into uh, a score between um, 0 and 1. Now, this network has only one output, and so we can only do a two-class classification. Um, and the module we're going to put here is the sigmoid function, also called logistic function. And so this function is uh, h of, uh, let's call it s, since we've called this s before, 1 over 1 plus exponential minus s. Okay, so this function, when s is very large, this exponential is equal to close to zero, and so h is equal to one, and when uh, uh, s is uh, very small or highly negative, uh, then this exponential becomes very large, and so the overall function is zero. Okay, so that function is like this, and here it's 0.5, and the asymptote here is plus 1, and here it's just 0. And 0 0.5 is unreadable. Okay? So I could just uh, take the output here, which I can call y bar. and plug this through some cost function. Which I compare with y, okay? Now, so y would be also a binary variable, 0 or 1. 
Now, what, what do this uh, cost function, what, what should it do? I could use squared error, right? So C could be equal to the difference between Y and Y bar squared. Sounds perfectly reasonable. It doesn't work very well. The reason it doesn't work very well is that the is that the sigmoid, uh, and, and people, you know, in the early days of neural nets in the 1980s were doing this very commonly, and the network wouldn't converge, and they would say neural nets don't work. But they were just doing it wrong. So uh, the problem that you have here is that uh, if y is equal to 1 for one class and 0 for the other class, the system wants to get the output equal to one, and it can't because it's an asymptote. So it tries to make the weights, W1, very, very large so that it gets to one or to zero. It has to make the weighted sum enormous, you know, if it, if it wants to uh, get close to the desired output. But there the gradient is very small, right? Because the derivative of that sigmoid, I mean, that sigmoid is very flat there. So when you backpropagate, the gradient is basically zero because the, the sigmoid is flat. So you get this saturation problem. So some people, like me, said, uh, you know, back in the old days, one of two things. Either you set your targets uh, in between, so not at the asymptotes, or you use a different loss, okay? So, uh, so basically you say, here is the sigmoid function. The target for category one is going to be at, I don't know, 0.8. And the target for category two is going to be at point two. So there, those would be attainable, and so the weights won't go to infinity, and you won't have those uh, problems. But here's another uh, idea, and the other idea is just take the log of it. Okay, take the log. So if you think about this, this little function here, it's actually a softmax. It's a softmax between two variables, one of which is equal to minus x, the other one is equal to one. And what you're getting is the softmax output from, from the input that's always equal to 1. Okay, let me write this function in another way. I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by e to the s. Okay, so I get e to the s divided by e to the s plus e to the s times e to the minus s, and that's 1. Okay? This is a softmax. A softmax where one input is 1, the other one is s, and what I'm looking at is the s, the output corresponding to the s input. So the sigmoid is just, you know, softmax is just a generalization of the sigmoid for multiple outputs. Um, now, if you take the log of this, you get S minus log of 1 plus e to the s. Okay. Another question is, and again, this is a special case of softmax with only two inputs where 1 is equal to 1. One of the, one of the two inputs is equal to 1. Okay, so the effect of the log, like, look at this, uh, this function here. This function looks like this. Where, when s is very large, the 1 doesn't count in the sum, and so you basically have log of exponential s, which is just s, right? So for large s, it's just the identity function. And for small s, the 1 dominates, and so it's log 1, which is 0. And so you get 0. Uh, 
it's kind of like a soft real you kind of thing. But the point is, it doesn't saturate. So you don't get those vanishing gradient issue. Yes, but you have a log in front, so log e power s is s. Yeah, so s minus s would be zero, right? Oh, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, if you could do s minus s, then I was just talking about the second term. Yeah, yeah. I mean, s minus this is kind of the other way around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you take the entire, the entire function, uh, it's, it's the exact opposite. Okay. Um, do you have softmax also as one of the exercises or no? Softmax is on the Yeah, right. Okay. All right. So let's... Uh, end with a few tricks, uh, practical tricks, and <clears throat> you'll, you'll see more of them uh, tomorrow and as you start playing with backprop. Um, so the idea of using ReLU instead of hyperbolic tension, so hyperbolic tension is just like the sigmoid I just showed, except that it's multiplied by two and you subtract one, so it, it goes from minus one to one instead of zero to one, um, but it's essentially the same shape. Huh? We saw it last week. Yeah, we talked about it last week. Uh, and they, they're both falling out of favor. Uh, ReLU tends to work much better when you have many layers. Uh, and probably the reason is that it's, uh, it's scale invariant in the sense that, or scale equivariant. If, uh, if the input is, uh, if you multiply the input by two, the output will be multiplied by two, but otherwise unchanged. Right? It's got only one kink, and so it has no scale to it. Whereas if you have two kinks, then you know the input has to have a particular variance to kind of fit those two kinks in the right place. Uh, so people will use ReLU. They use cross entropy loss for classification. Log softmax is a special case, uh, a simple special case of uh, uh, cross entropy loss. Uh, we'll we'll come back to that. There's a word of caution there. Yes. Uh, Loss functions in PyTorch that are for classification, such as cross entropy loss, like definitely expect the log softmaxes, but it's super easy to accidentally miss that in the documentation. <laughs> You'll use a softmax instead of a log softmax and be debugging for hours. Right, yeah. You want to use log softmax, not softmax, definitely. Uh, if you feed it to a uh, cross entropy loss function, it expects outputs from a log softmax, not a softmax. Uh, and if you don't know this yet, you might waste a lot of time. Um, use stochastic gradient on mini batches. We talked about this before. Uh, you want to shuffle the training sample. So if you use stochastic gradient, the order of the examples matters. Uh, if, if you have, uh, I don't know, a 10 way classification, you're doing MNIST, right? You're classifying the 10 digits from 0 to 9. If you put all the zeros, then all the ones, then all the twos, then et cetera, it's not going to work. Because what's going to happen is that in the first few examples of zeros, the system will adapt the biases of the last layer to just produce the correct output, and we'll never learn what a zero looks like. And then you show a one, and it's going to take just a few samples for it to adapt the biases so that it learns to produce one without actually looking at the input. And it's going to keep doing this for eons and eons, and it's never going to converge. So you absolutely need to shuffle the examples. Uh, in the case of MNIST, but it's true also for a lot of uh, others, uh, you probably want, uh, in a mini-batch, uh, as I said before, in a mini-batch, you want examples of all the categories. If you really want to use a mini-batch, uh, use samples from different categories. And if you don't use a mini-batch, just you know, have samples of different categories, one after the other. Uh, there is debates as to whether you need to change the order of the samples at every pass through the samples. It's not entirely clear. Uh, some people claim it's better if you don't. Some people 
People claim it's better if you do, with you know, various theoretical arguments for it. Uh, you need to normalize the input variables. So if you look at standard uh, code that people publish for training on ImageNet or speech recognition or whatever, uh, the first operation they do is that they, they, uh, they normalize the inputs. What do they do? They, um, So an image is really going to be three planes, R, G, and B. OK, so it's, uh, think of it as a three-dimensional array, where the first dimension is uh, color plane, and the other two dimensions are space, or sometimes the other way around. Sometimes the channel is last. Um, but it's better to think of it this way. Um, so what you do is you take each of those guys, so let's say blue, you compute the mean of uh, all, the, all the variables in this blue image, and you do this for every single image in your training set. Okay? Take the entire training set, or a good chunk of it, and compute the mean of all the blue uh, inputs for the entire training set. That gives you a single scalar, right? Let's call it MB. So it's the mean of all the blues, OK? So in terms of C, you can do the same. You can compute the standard deviation, right? Compute the variance of all the blues and take the square root. That's the standard deviation, sigma B. Do the same for green. Do the same for red. OK, so you get six numbers, six scalar values. And now what you do is you take uh, whenever you see an image, um, you take the R component, uh, IJ, uh, and to normalize it, you replace it by itself minus the mean divided by the standard deviation or the max of the standard deviation and some small quantity so it doesn't blow up. Uh, what does that do for you? It normalizes the contrast and, it, and it, it makes the variance zero. This is good for various reasons. In fact, it's a good idea to have variables inside of a neural net that are zero mean and you need variants or kind of variants that are more or less all the same. Of course, you do this also for the green and the blue. Yeah. Across across many images, it's a single mean. For all the images, you calculate the mean. Yeah, I mean there's various ways to do it. Some uh, you can do it. For a single image, for a group of images, you can do it, which is what Batchmon does. Uh, you can also do it like on a small piece of an image. Uh, that's called high-pass filtering. But the simplest thing is, and what almost everybody does in kind of standard, standard image net pipeline or image processing, image recognition pipeline with conventional nets, for example, is this. Yeah, the channels have very different uh, means, and and so, you know, uh, in a typical natural image, uh, when you're in, you know, outside and inside, the the components would be very different. You'll have color shift, uh, and the amplitude of uh, blue is uh, relatively low. For example, if you are in full sun, the amplitude of red is basically non-existent. If you are underwater. Um, so, you know, if, uh, if you want any kind of uh, signal, you need to kind of uh, normalize. This is basically like automatic gain control. Uh, the means are very different, of course, because that depends on the overall luminosity, and you don't want a system that uh, 
where the recognition depends too much on the global illumination of your image. So that's a way of kind of getting rid of global illumination if you want. And sort of, you know, kind of bad tuning of your ex exposure or contrast or whatever it is. Uh, but there's very good sort of numerical reasons for doing this. Uh, so in most um, uh, pre-cooked, and, and we'll come back for why this is a good idea, okay, uh, later. In most uh, pre-cooked code, you will also find things uh, scheduled to decrease the learning rate. So the learning rate, the ADA uh, system, first of all, most systems don't use just plain stochastic gradient. They use things like Atom, which automatically adapt the, the step size. Or other tricks, uh, they also use what's called a momentum trick, um, or nested off momentum in particular, um, you know, which Adam integrates. Uh, and generally, if you really want good results, you need to kind of decrease your learning rate at, as time goes by. And so there are kind of standard ways of, you know, scheduling the decrease of the learning rate that, that, that you can use. Um, Occasionally, not always, um, you can use a bit of L2 or L1 regularization on the weight. Uh, so what does that mean? That means, so L2 regularization means at every update, you multiply every weight by Y minus a small constant, multiplied by the learning rate. So basically... And people call this weight decay. Statisticians call this L2 regularization. Basically, you have an additional, in, in addition to your, uh, in your, in your loss function, in addition to your cost, you have a regularization term that only depends on the weight. The cost depends on the sample as well, right? Uh, and you have some sort of variable to control this importance here. So L2 regularization means uh, our W equals the square norm of W. When you compute the gradient of R with respect to uh, a particular component of W, uh, what you get is two um, two W I. And so, in the update rule, uh, when you do Wi is replaced by Wi minus eta gradient of your overall loss with respect to W. Uh, what you get is Wi minus eta times the gradient of the cost with respect to W uh, minus, because it's a minus gradient, to alpha Wi. This is Wi. Oh, you're right. Which I can rewrite as, so this is WI, and I can rewrite as WI times 1 minus 2 eta alpha minus eta DC over DWI. Okay, so what does that mean? You take every weight and at every iteration you shrink it by a constant that's slightly less than one. And so that's why it's called weight decay. In the absence of any gradient from C, the weights exponentially decay to zero. Okay, so what that does is that it tries to tell the system uh, you know, minimize my cost function, but do it with a weight vector that is as short as possible. 
Okay, the other one is L1, so L1 regularization. Uh, is basically a regularization term equal to um, sum over i of absolute value of uh, wi, sorry, not z. Which is the L1 norm. So when you do the, the gradient update, you get uh, wi minus eta dc over dwi. And then what is the gradient of this? Um, or minus the gradient of this, that would be um, sine of wi, and of course you need the alpha in front. So this is a constant, which is, posit which is uh, positive if wi is positive, negative if it's negative, but there is a minus sign in front, so um, Basically here, uh, wi is being shrunk towards zero by a constant equal to eta times alpha. Uh, the statisticians call this lasso. Least absolute whatever. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's some cute acronym, right? There's some sort of pun in it, but, um, and they pronounce it lasso for a reason I never understood. Um, and so that basically shrinks the, all the weights towards zero by a constant. And what that means is that if a weight is not useful, it's going to get eliminated to zero. Okay? And, uh, that is very interesting when you have like uh, a very large, particular, a very large, uh, like a, a network with a very large number of inputs, many of which are not very useful. This will basically eliminate the inputs that are not very useful because the weights that connect to it will go to zero. So, one other question. Uh, another question. So, when would we use L2 regularization over the L1 regularization in Okay, so first of all, you don't want to use it at at the start, because uh, there is a curious thing with neural nets, which is that um, the origin of weight space is kind of a settle point. And so if you, if you crank up L1 or L2 initially, the weights just go to zero and nothing works. So, um, so, so it's in one of the tricks, actually, I, I, I forgot uh, a very important one in this list, uh, which is that the weights have to be initialized in a neural net, and they have to be initialized properly. There's various tricks that are built into PyTorch to initialize. Uh, one trick is called the Kaiming trick. It's actually the Leon Boutou trick from 20 years earlier. But, um, and the idea is, uh, it was reinvented multiple times. But the idea is uh, you, you want the, the weights uh, that, that go into a unit to be, to be random. I mean, you initialize them randomly, but you don't want them to be too large or too small. You want them to be kind of roughly the right size so that the output is roughly the same variance as the inputs. Okay, so if the inputs to a unit are independent, the variance of the output, uh, the variance of the weighted sum, will be equal to the sum of the variances of the input multiplied by weighted by the square of the weights. Okay? So if you want, if you have n inputs and you want the output to have the same variance as the input, you need the weights to be proportional to the inverse square root of the number of inputs. Okay, and that's, that's basically the trick. So you initialize the weights to values which are drawn randomly uh, with zero mean, and the variance is uh, one over the square root of the number of inputs to that unit. Okay, and that's you know hard you know built into PyTorch as well. So initialization is super important, and it it can't if you do it wrong, your network is not going to converge. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
regularization that also decreased over the number of defaults? Sorry, increased. Mm, well, I mean, you probably want to start with a alpha equals zero, and then maybe crank it up. And then it depends, you know, how much you want to regularize, how much is necessary. I mean, a lot of people just don't use any, okay, either L1 or L2. But they do use dropout. Okay, so dropout is another type of regularization. Uh, and, it, and you can think of it as a layer inside of a neural net that you just insert in the neural net. And what dropout does is that it randomly... Uh, it's, a, it's a box that has an input and an output, and uh, it randomly sets n over two of the outputs to zero. And it's a random draw at every new sample that you draw. That layer basically kills half of its components. Okay? That seems crazy, right? Um, but in fact, it kind of makes the other variables more robust. Basically, it forces the system to not rely on any single unit to produce an answer. It sort of distributes the information across all the units because it knows that during training, you know, half of them can disappear. So it, it tends to kind of distribute the information better. It's a trick that, uh, you know, Jeff Hinton and his team came up with and it turns out to be a, f you know, quite efficient way of regularizing neural nets. A lot of people use, I mean, there's variations of it, but. And we'll talk about more of those. They are in one of those papers, Efficient Backprops, uh, that I wrote many years ago and that you are invited to read. Okay, last thing for today, uh, even though we are late. Um, this trick, I, I mean, this, this whole framework of having a compute graph and backpropagating to it, of course, it doesn't work just for uh, stacked module. It works for any arrangement of module, including the ones that are dynamical that depend on, on, on the inputs question. Yeah, uh, so the question is why, why do we care about the fact that values are scale equivariant if we're going to normalize anyway? The question is why do you normalize too? So if you have sigmoids and you normalize, you're basically forcing the system. If your normalize is the variance, for example, is too small, then the system is not going to be able to use the nonlinearity in the sigmoid hyperbolic tangent, let's say. Uh, if you make it too small, it's going to saturate. So what's the right setup? Not clear. Well, you, you don't care. As long as it's the same variance all over the network. If it's not the same variance all over the network, then you know, you're going to get issues. Uh, some layers are going to learn faster than others. Some are going to diverge when others are converging. So uh, you want the variances to be roughly the same all over the network. And uh, you know, that's what things like batch norm uh, do for you. We haven't talked about batch norm yet. But. OK, that's it for today. Thank you. See you next week.